Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very happy to bring the conversation I had with Paul Smaldino. Paul is an Associate Professor of Cognitive Information Sciences and Faculty in Quantitative and Systems Biology Graduate Program uh, at UC uh, Merkitt. He is also affiliated with the Center for Analytic Political Engagement and Center for Interdisciplinary Neuroscience and is external professor at Santa Fe Institute. Uh, much of his research is on how behaviors emerge and evolve in response to social, cultural, and ecological pressures. He's also interested in cultural evolution, cooperation, complex systems. Uh, he has such a wide uh, range of um, interest and such a wonderful background. He's really done so much in such a short time. He's really done some really, really good uh, uh, training and, and education and research and big projects and written a lot of great papers in different fields. He's, he's very multidisciplinary. He's, he's, um, he's great. He's absolutely wonderful. He's such a nice person. And he wrote a, a, a really good, I think it's a sort of textbook, but um, so some of it has like, there's some like kind of coding kinds of stuff in there, but the, the, the chapters where it's just kind of like the written format is, is, is great. I, I, I found it, um, I don't do research full time, but I found it really engaging. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think it's super important. That book is called Modeling Social Behavior, Mathematical and Agent-Based Models of Social Dynamics and Cultural Evolution. And it is really, really good. Um, I feel like if this book was given to undergraduates or even, um, you know, uh, graduates in like a, a research methods course. Um, we would just have better scientists out there. Uh, he's, he's really good. He's really, really good at, at, at talking about this stuff in, in really uh, kind of tangible ways. Um, and, and also kind of getting into in the details as well. Uh, so we, we start the conversation by talking about why modeling and social sciences are important we talk about quantitative and qualitative data and, and the ways that uh, people look at the different types there. We talk about models, what they are, how we define them. We talk about decomposition with complexity science. We talk about modeling with multivariate questions such as intelligence or personality or other things. We have a really nice bit in the conversation about the importance of theory and how that's instructive in creating hypotheses. Uh, and then we get a few examples. We talk about a little bit about how modeling uh, was important for COVID-19 and understanding it, modeling in politics and how it's important, and, and many other uh, wonderful topics. Uh, I, I, I really find this conversation super important for social sciences. Again, you know, in, in clinical psychology and social psychology and sociology, um, you know, all these different social sciences, we are greatly uh, impoverished with good science and people doing good science, both the statistics, how they build research uh, questions, uh, how do they you know, use or not use th theory. Uh, we just really have a, a need for good social science. And he, his book is great. Um, he's, he's wonderful. And um, I, I think it's really important that people, uh, you know, kind of uh, learn from what he's saying and try to incorporate that in their own uh, research and uh, in their own social science uh, methods that they're using. Uh, as always, you can find this conversation and all the conversations at Converging Dialogues at Substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. So get over there, follow, like, subscribe, share with your friends. Um, you can also contribute as well. Much appreciate it. And um, really telling, telling people if, if you like the conversation or you listen to a few other ones and you like it, um, sharing on social media or just telling people about it uh, really goes a long way. And so uh, it's really great to, to see that. And uh, now I bring you Paul Smalino. I am here with Paul Smaldino. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to, to talking with you. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, you've written a a really important book, I would say. I would say it's very important, especially for someone that's uh, in the field of a social science. Um, the book is called Modeling Social Behavior, Mathematical and Agent-Based Models of Social Dynamics and Cultural Evolution. Uh, it's it's uh, very, very, very helpful. I think it's very, very good, especially for folks that are doing social science research. So before we get into it, um, why don't you tell listeners... Uh, who you are, kind of academically and professionally, and um, what you're what you're currently doing. 
Yeah, uh, I am currently a professor of cognitive and information sciences at the University of California uh, in Merced. Um, I also have an affiliation here with uh, the Quantitative and Systems Biology Program, the Center for Analytic Political Engagement, and the Center for uh, Interdisciplinary Neuroscience. Um, And I'm also external uh, faculty at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I have my experience kind of runs around a lot of the the different social sciences at various times in my life. I, I had appointments in departments of psychology, anthropology, political science, computer science, and uh, and a school of medicine. Hmm. Um, so I, I've 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 really interacted with a lot of you know uh, colleagues and and other people <laughs> throughout throughout the social sciences. Mm, yeah, well, you certainly have uh, traversed the landscape, if you will. You've been in and out of a bunch of different things, which which is great because if someone's going to write a book like this, you would want them to have had exposure experience with all these different places. So that's wonderful. Uh, do you mostly teach now? Or are you doing research or what do you mostly do, I guess, with your, your day well, job, I guess? I, I do. I do a lot of things, uh, but <laughs> I, I do teach, uh, but I, I also do a lot, uh, quite a lot of research. Um, nice. So, yeah, I, w- I would say... You know, I, I more than I, I do research more than I teach, uh, although I guess if you count, you know, sort of mentoring more mm-hmm. junior scientists uh, as teaching, then I also do quite a bit of teaching. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I teach usually, usually at least one class uh, every every semester. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So it's very research heavy, which is which is nice. So uh, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious here. So on this book. Um, you started out by talking about why there's a need for modeling um, or science of social dynamics. Uh, now, I've talked to a few people and they have a little bit of some hesitation about this, right? Because I think the argument goes, well, should we be making models on things that are super ambiguous and abstract and, you know, there's dangers with it and, stu- and such. So maybe make the case for why we need modeling and how you would respond to any criticisms of people that might say, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some, we should be more tentative about that. I find that really interesting because to my view, one of the main sort of value added components of building formal models, and I'll get into what exactly that means, is to remove or at least reduce ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's sort of the whole point, right? So in the social sciences, social sciences are really interesting. Um, we're trying to deal with really complicated and complex phenomena uh, and often constructs that are colloquial, verbal. And it can make sort of making headway uh, in terms of, of formulating theory and generalizable claims really difficult. And I think that one of the main approaches uh, that we can, we can use is to try to cut down on the ambiguity by specifying exactly what we mean or don't mean when we talk about, let's say, some theory or some hypothesis. Um, I can give you a few examples. So, sure. uh, you know, one that's sort of more recent, uh, let's just take an example of something that I got a little bit involved in early in my career, which was sort of this uh, work related to social identity uh, and, and, a, and a body of work that in social psychology is called optimal distinctiveness theory. That's sort of mm-hmm. the kind of theory that people in social psychology might use. That's sort of like theory that I like to put kind of scare quotes on uh, because it's, it's an idea. It's this idea that we have identity and how we represent ourselves is uh, rel- related to competing needs for differentiation and assimilation with others. So we don't want to be too different because we need a group, but we don't want to be just like everyone else because we need to differentiate ourselves. Mm. And then exactly how this works, exactly what it means to sort of choose an identity is left pretty ambiguous. And there's this verbal assumption that If everyone does that, then they'll end up with the optimal identity for themselves. Hmm. But it's an open question as to whether or not that's true. So uh, with some colleagues, just, you know, kind of for fun, uh, we worked through several different 
possible interpretations of this theory. And on the one hand, you say, okay, well, let's imagine first we model identity as being a member of a distinct, discrete group. And I can choose which group I am based on my needs for distinctiveness and, and assimilation. Well, it turns out if everyone can see all the groups and they're joining groups and leaving groups, what happens is everyone ends up in a group that's too big and they're not distinct enough. And then by the time that happens, it's too late. There are no groups. The groups that are more distinct are, are too distinct. They're too small. And so everyone mm -hmm. ends up in a group that's a little bit too big rather than being in one that's way too small. Uh, on the other hand, though, if you model distinctiveness as being on some continuous trait that you can move back and forth with, uh, then it, it depends on how you measure distinctiveness. Is it about an absolute difference or a relative difference? If it's relative mm -hmm. difference, and mm -hmm. I just want to be like some percentage or some amount of a standard deviation above or below the average, well, then what happens is everyone converges to the same thing. And we get sort of, uh, this is, uh, we got some press, this is about eight years ago, uh, Discover covered this as math explains why hipsters all look alike. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but that same model, we were like, well, what if it's absolute difference and you just want to be some amount difference? Well, and then in that case, you can get the maintenance of, of persistent differences across time. Mm -hmm. And the point here is not to say either of these formulations or any of these formulations are the correct way to model the situation, mm -hmm. but rather the way it's modeled leads to different kinds of conclusions. And so the process of modeling it remo removes ambiguity because it allows us to say, well, if we mean it like this, then these are the consequences of that assumption. But if we mean it like that, then we have different consequences. So now all of a sudden we have targets for, okay, which do we mean? So which mm -hmm. assumptions are the best supported by the empirical data? And we have conclusions. If particular assumptions hold, then we should see certain other kinds of patterns in empirical data that we can get and go test. So to me, it, 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 it's completely backward to think we don't want to model because we have an ambiguous situation. For me, modeling is the correction that is applied to an ambiguous situation. I guess the question I have here on the modeling piece is if there's a bunch of different models, like you're saying, you could have, you know, the model is the model, right? But more so on how you construct it. I guess the question is, is there a fear that maybe if the model could, could it potentially be over precise for something, right? So you're, that this illusion of that we're creating an understanding about something that's not really there. Is there ever that worry of like, do we get too wrapped up in the model necessarily? I'm not saying in, in this scenario, I'm just saying generally. Oh yeah. Uh, you bring up a really good point. Absolutely. There is a phenomenon that uh, some people in, in economics, for example, like uh, behavioral economists have talked about what they sometimes call theory-based blindness, mm -hmm. such an obsession with the theory, with, with, the predictions of the model that they stop looking back at the world. And this is a big problem, right? I mean, this is true all the time. We need constant feedback between the models and the empirical situation, the data, let's say. Um, a model, a model is a, is, is a logical engine. And the job of that engine is to turn assumptions into conclusions. Yeah. So when we build a model, we lay out all of our assumptions, and then we can work out the necessary logical conclusions, the consequences of those assumptions. But how much credence we should give to those consequences is entirely dependent on how well we can support the assumptions we've made. And so mm -hmm. absolutely... We have to be constantly cautious about whether or not the assumptions we're making in our model uh, justify making decisions based on the outcomes of some model. Yeah, absolutely. We often, uh, so, like I said, the social sciences, I mean, the social world is super complicated. So we can have a model that assumes people behave in some way, and maybe even that's the way they do behave. But the mm -hmm. implicit in the model is often something like 
also an assumption about how people interact or the information that they have or who, in fact, they can influence. And if those assumptions are wrong or not accurate representations, we can lead to wrong conclusions if we base our decisions on the assumption that, let's say, the population is well mixed or everyone has the same information or, you know, the set of possible decisions are only A and B and not C and D. Mm -hmm. So there is constantly a, a process of iterative reevaluations of these models. And, and I think that you're right, that people are uh, sometimes, especially in certain fields, a little bit overly quick to, to jump to conclusions. I mean, there is a natural desire for people to want to see sort of added value immediately. And to be able to say, I want to be able to make, to use some tool to make a decision now. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we can do that, especially for cases where we have really uh, well-developed theory that's been worked on for decades or, and maybe very high precision, high quality data. So a lot of epidemiology is, is a good example of this. We have very good theory about how epidemics work. We have very good data for a lot of diseases and, and uh, and population structures, and we can make pretty good predictions uh, about certain epidemic systems. Uh, there's an there's an exception when a brand new disease comes on, and then the the, the models kind of lag behind a little bit. But for mo sure. for disease systems that are like really well understood, let's say like dengue fever or malaria, uh, we have very good models. Hmm. And for other systems like the economy. And, uh, you know, the flow of information, polarization, our models are still at an earlier stage, both in terms of the data that we have and the, the state of the theories that have been developed. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to build models. It just means that we're not there yet. We're still working on them. Hmm. I also think about how it is in physics, too. People make models in physics all the time. Um, you know, maybe the kind of, you know, popular one that people know is, you know, string theory. It's, you know, it's a model. We can't prove it. We can't analyze, you know, and all these things, but you're right. Economics uses models, obviously, um, you know, social psychology uses models and sociology, um, et cetera. I guess something you talk about in the book, uh, throughout is this emphasis on the models that you pr pr propose are based in or rooted in quantitative techniques. And, you know, the, the short answer, the answer I'm assuming you're going to say is, look, qualitative and quantitative techniques are both important. We should use them when we're doing good science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to pit it as quantitative versus qualitative. They're obviously both important. But I guess for you, what's the emphasis or what is the, I guess, if you will, the thick ice of sorts of having models rooted in quantitative, maybe as opposed to qualitative uh, techniques and data? Yeah, I mean, some of it is what I've already said, which is about removing ambiguity. Um, I think the process of formalization helps us be really clear about what our assumptions are. And then we can also leverage the techniques of quantitative approaches, mathematics or computer simulation uh, to work out not just sort of vague intuitions, but, but even precise conditions, or at least precise mathematical conditions uh, for when certain kinds of behaviors or phenomena are likely or unlikely. We can generate all kinds of uh, descriptions about certain phenomena. Now, sometimes we can generate really, really precise ideas about this is exact, this is what's going to happen. Um, but sometimes we can do something that's kind of in between, right? Um, so, you know, we write down, we use mathematics or we use computer code, our assumptions about some sorts of systems, and then we use these to derive the necessary consequences of those assumptions. Uh, there, I think there's a lot of ways that this is helpful. Um, I'll name two. So one is we can just determine whether or not some idea is plausible. Uh, so. Sometimes people call this a how possibly explanation. It doesn't mean that it's how actually the phenomenon mm -hmm. happens, but it is showing that some mechanism might be possible under some conditions. And we can 
investigate, you know, what the conditions are for certain assumptions, what assumptions have to hold for some mechanism to be at play. And then we can determine whether or not those assumptions make sense. Um, more the other, you know, side of that, or the other, uh, the additional aspect is that we lay out all the assumptions we're making very explicitly. I've already kind of mentioned this, but you know, what happens, this often exposes the weakness in our own thinking. I think we often think we understand things clearer than we really do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let's say you have some theory about how some social phenomenon works. Uh, and so you try to write down uh, what it is. You may find that actually, in order to write the whole thing down, you need to make a bunch of assumptions that, and you don't know what the right assumption is. All of a sudden, the, the process of formalizing it exposes gaps in your knowledge. And that becomes targets for further investigation, whether it's more theorizing or whether it's now I have to go do an empirical study or find data on this so that I know what the right assumption to make is. More importantly, or moreover, it allows theories to accumulate mm. and get better over time. So if we just use verbal theories, people tend to kind of take the theory wholesale. First of all, what happens is lots of people, let's say like Marxism, um, you can, you know, person A might say I'm a Marxist and person B might say I'm a Marxist and they both go on talking about Marxism, but actually because Marx didn't write, any, write down any equations, they're, they're using their own mental interpretations of Marxism and actually they may be making very different assumptions and it's yeah. very difficult to identify what those assumptions are until you write them down mathematically. Mm -hmm. Also, like if it's, if it's, if it's right or wrong, we usually say either Marxism is right or Marxism is wrong. I like it. I don't like it, but it's really hard to build on it to say, well, mm -hmm. it's right up to this point, but it makes this assumption that's wrong or limiting. So let's, let's build on it and say, well, what happens if this new assumption is made and let's happen? What about this assumption or that assumption? Whereas when we have formal models, you can build a model and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but let's say it's pretty good, but I, I read it and I'm like, you know, this is really interesting, but you did assume that I'll stick with this population structure example that, you know, all the interactions are at random that the population is sort of well mixed. I might say, well, that's not real, really realistic. Actually, people are structured in social networks. And when people are connected, they tend to be similar and that's going to affect the dynamics. So I'll take a bunch of your, the assumptions wholesale from your model and put them into mine, but I'll add this assumption. And now we've got a continuum, a, a sort of continuous body of research that continued to build on each other. And this is, I think, the hallmark of a mature science is this mm. ability to, to build cumulative theories. Mm. You're getting to the question that I, I, I probably should have asked in the beginning, but, uh, which is what are models, <laughs> right? Right. Which is because you're, you're, you're describing something that, so, so to this point, we haven't talked about even hypotheses per se, at least not directly. We haven't talked about, you know, what kind of method you use. We haven't talked about the instruments. We haven't talked about uh, the actual data and then conclusions. All of this is, is kind of in beforehand. Like what's the model someone's using before they begin, uh, you yeah. know, a study or what are they looking for? And listeners can hear that that's, um, I don't want to say it's not science because it's a part of science, but it feels very abstract in a lot of ways. It feels very, very abstract. So, so all this is like, what are models um, and models in science? And then maybe talk about, you know, what you would describe as agent-based uh, models as well. Yeah. So I, ha I have kind of a long-winded answer to this question. Go ahead. That I'm Go ahead. Take it away. <laughs> uh, you know, so a model is, we use models. The, the word model can mean a lot of things but in the book. You know, you can, a model is any abstract or physical structure that potentially represents some real world phenomenon. 
So we use these all the time as tools for thinking, just informally, not even as part of science, whether or not we're aware of them. So we, we think we know maybe how people work or whatever works in some situation, and we represent people or situations in some simplified way in our heads. Like you have a model of like, if you work in an office, you have a model of sort of how the office works and, and the important factors about all the people in the office that help you make decisions about what you're going to do and what's likely to happen. And that's just something it's like a schema, do. right? A like schema. a schema, yeah, a mental yeah. model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but scientists use all sorts of models too. And we, we do this too, because we're also people, but uh, there we have more precise models where we're saying we, we can write down or, or point exactly to what the model is and what the representation is. It's, it's sometimes a kind of analogy or the kind of representation. Um, we have physical models, right? Engineers build this all the time. You build a model bridge, you build a model, mm-hmm. you know, a model airplane, uh, not a model airplane, like a hobbyist, but like an engineer would build, <laughs> um, to get at what are the important relationships in the small stripped down simplified version that will help you make decisions about the big scaled up version. Uh, in the book, I talk about the San Francisco Bay model, which is still exists in Sausalito, which was built by the U S army Corps of engineers in the 1950s and sixties. And there were all these projects on the table for damming parts of the San Francisco Bay, which is a massive, massive, you know, system of waterways and building a dam is a hugely expensive project. And not knowing what the downstream, no pun intended, consequences are going to be of building a dam would be, you know, potentially catastrophic. So they built the scale model of the entire uh, Bay Area, of the, the whole Bay and a lot of the outlets. Um, and it's about, it's about an acre or two. And it's in mm-hmm. Sausalito. You can go check it out. It's still there. It's open to the public. And uh, based on that, they, they sort of tried damming it and showed, okay, this is actually going to have really bad consequences. We better not do it. Mm-hmm. Um, we use animal models. Like most, there are some people that I, their passion is understanding rats or fruit flies, but most people who study rats and fruit flies aren't passionate about rats and fruit flies per se. They're interested in general principles of physiology or genetics or behavior and using this organism as a model for the larger set of, let's say, all animals or all vertebrates in the case of mice, uh, or maybe all mammals. And using it by analogy, what we learn about this model system, we can then extrapolate and draw inferences about other similar systems. And and behavioral scientists might think they don't use models, but they do. If you are a psychologist or behavioral economist and you're running experiments, like uh, one of my favorite examples is like the the marshmallow test. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, you put a marshmallow, you take it, it's basically child torture and you take, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you bring a a kid into a room and you put a marshmallow in front of them and you say, all right, I'm going to be back a little bit later. And if, if that marshmallow is still there, I'll give you a second marshmallow. You can eat them both. But if you eat it before I come back, you, you don't get the second marshmallow. And, um, most people are not actually interested in marshmallows per se. They don't care Mm -hmm. about how long children can eat marshmallow. It's not, they're not studying. That's not the thing they're interested in. They're using the scenario as a model for a wider class of behaviors related to things like willpower or trust and authority that the scenario is designed to capture. It turns out this, they used to think that this was all about, you know, uh, how much willpower kids have. And it turns out probably more like have they been raised in an environment that uh, where sort of strange adults are likely to be trustworthy. But uh, regardless, right. It's the, that's not the scenario uh, itself. It's you're studying the model because the thing that you actually want to study is maybe too difficult or too complicated or just unavailable to study. Um, and so social systems are really complicated and we, we, can build formal models. Uh, a formal model is just writing down a set of, it's, it's constructing a hypothetical model of some system and then formalizing it using equations or, and or computer code. 
And so uh, one of the things that's a really key component in building a model is decomposition. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to talk about this now yeah. or later. Go ahead. Um, so all systems right, are interconnected. The world is super complicated. A model represents reality, but it only represents a part of reality. It can't represent all of reality because the only mm -hmm. way to represent all of reality is with reality. Mm -hmm. right? This is why the first chapter of the book is called Doing Violence to Reality. Because <laughs> When we, when we do science, we have to do something that, that, that's unnatural in a way. We, we cleave nature into essential and inessential components. That's not, that's not a true thing, right? All, in reality, all, of, all the components are important and, and are, are essential to make it all work. Mm -hmm. but when we try to build a theory of some phenomenon that involves some system, we have to say, well, what are the essential parts to our theory? And what are the inessential parts? And we're going to ignore all the inessential parts for now. What we hope are the inessential parts. Maybe we will have to eventually revise our theory to include some things that we didn't include at first. But we write these things down and we decompose our system into a set of parts. Hmm. What are the parts that are essential? And then of those parts, what are the properties of them that are essential to our theory? Hmm. So if we build a model of human beings in a social world, we're not modeling height or hair color or, you know, physical strength. We might not even be modeling gender or age, but we might, depending on whether or not that's important. We're usually not, you know, modeling the wind or the color or the feel of the grass or the shapes of the buildings. We might not model the physical world at all, but we might. Maybe we have to model the streets or the geography, or maybe we model connections as a social network, or we don't care about physical structure so much as we care about who tends to interact with whom. Hmm. And these, this kind of decomposition is at the core of what modeling is. And the, the real challenge is that if you're trying to build a theory of something, there is no correct decomposition. This is, this is Herbert Simon's decomposition. Yeah. Um, it is an idea that starts with Herbert Simon, but the person who uh, my ideas are probably most strongly connected to is Stuart Kaufman, okay. uh, writing about a decade after Herb Simon, and, and mm -hmm. so this early 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, so Herb Simon, I mean, this tremendously important, influential person, sure. wrote Architecture of Complexity and talks about sort of the near decomposability of systems. Um, but Stuart Kaufman, who's sort of a, a big deal figure in complexity science or you know, theories of complex systems, uh, most known later for his work on, well, a number of things, but uh, you know, developing NK landscape models and Boolean gene networks. Um, but he uh, wrote this really, to me, extremely influential paper in the early 1970s on the articulation of parts in explanations, hmm. uh, in scientific explanations. Um, and he, so a lot of my thinking has, has been influenced by Kaufman, but I'll, I'll just go with what I think because his yeah. argument slightly, is slightly obtuse. But basically the idea is you can think of any number of ways to decompose a system, but different decompositions are going to be useful for different kinds of explanations. and they're going to be useful for answering different kinds of questions. So let's say I'm interested, you know, in social relationships because I want to know, well, let me back up. If I have some question, I can decompose a social system into parts in any number of ways, right? If I'm a psychologist interested in collective social behavior, I'm going to model the individuals involved. I'm going to maybe model their preferences maybe things of other characteristics about them, maybe things about their power relationships or other kinds of relationships. And I'm going to model, let's say, certain kinds of behaviors that they can do that are important to the kinds of phenomena that I'm interested. Let's say, you know, stereotype decisions or um, let's say I'm an economist, a microeconomist. I might, you know, model their preferences as relate to economic decisions and have capture things about their buying power and their decision-making in making certain economic choices. But let's say I'm a macroeconomist and I actually don't, don't care about each individual person. I care about their aggregate behavior as relates to the firms that they're in. So 
the units I care about are the firms and let's say the government institutions that relate to the firms. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can go down the other way, right? If I'm a neuroscientist, I care about the physiology and I can't just model individuals just as they are. I have to model their brains and their relationship between brain regions. And how we decompose the system is is essential, essentially related to the kinds of questions that we want to ask about it and, and can ask about it. So how could, I, how could sorry, yeah. how could you do that with if I'm trying to decompose certain parts that are essential, let's say, and let's say with psychologists, how would we do that with something like personality or temperament or or even intelligence, even though there's a little bit more quantitative stuff with intelligence, there's so many different factors that go into, or so many variables that go into intelligence, but uh, even something more, um, you know, abstract, like personality or temperament. uh, How do you, how do you decompose for those pieces? Yeah, Uh, that's a good question. And I, I think, so the book is called modeling social behavior. Mm-hmm. And as such, the, the models that I tend to use tend to have fairly simplified assumptions about the nature of individuals because I'm interested in how large aggregates of individuals behave where the assumption is we can largely average out some of those individual differences. But not always. And I, I have worked on models of that were designed to explain differences in the distribution of personality traits across cultures. Mm. And there's some really interesting data, for example, indicates that, uh, you know, we have these five factor models, these big five personalities. I was, I was assuming that's what was used. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a theoretical cross cultural kind of, you know, uh, you know, it's a very solid model for personality and has been replicated, et cetera, et cetera. So I would, I would assume that would be the, the, the one that was used. Yeah, it's, I, you're exactly right. It has replicated and it is totally a theoretical. There's no reason why uh, these should be the five factors. I mean, people have sort of constructed post hoc explanations for mm-hmm. why maybe it makes mm-hmm. sense, but there's no a priori reason that would mm-hmm. predict these are the five that emerge. And it turns out they do replicate, but they replicate better in some places than others. They tend to replicate well in the places that are similar to where they were developed, like the industrialized West. (laughs) And if you take them to, you know, communities that are really different, like if you take them to small scale foraging or horticultural societies Mm -hmm. in the rainforests or in the Sahara, they don't replicate. Mm -hmm. They don't replicate well at all. And even among industrialized nations, they replicate better in some places than others. And uh, by which I mean the orthogonality Mm -hmm. of the five factors differs and is sort of strongest in cultures that are most similar to the highly industrialized countries like the US and the UK. And the weird people, all the the weird weird people. people, Right. (laughs) The weird people, as Joe Henrik would say. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, The in other places, uh, you get, even though you're not supposed to get correlations between things like extroversion and neuroticism, you do. Mm. And, you know, we built uh, a model that sort of tried to explain why mm. by modeling, uh, you know, a number of factors. We modeled individuals as just having, you know, X number of traits and then showed that uh, if we put them in societies where the number of, sort of socioeconomic niches varied, we said that those niches you know, would maybe they, they choose what niche to assort into based on their initial temperament. Maybe they don't. Maybe they can't. Maybe they mm-hmm. can. Um, the results are similar either way, although a little stronger if they can. Um, and then they're influenced, as we all are, by the kinds of social and economic situations we end up in, right? We modify our behaviors and our, you know, manifestations of our personalities based on the kinds of behavioral strategies that work for us where we are. Mm -hmm. And in some societies, there are just sort of more ways to be that are successful Mm. than in Mm -hmm. others. Mm. And so we built an agent-based model of this idea 
And in this model, we don't model any of the, the personality traits explicitly in terms of what their behavioral output are and what they mean for behavior. We just said there are these number of traits. Mm-hmm. And we looked at how they became more or less correlated over time, depending on how many influences there were. Hmm. And we showed that we could, we could, A, generate very similar patterns to what's observed empirically, where the more socioeconomic niches there are, the, the less correlation we get between traits. And we also found that in those cases, the model predicted that individual traits should have more variance, sort of more hmm. diverse societies which was not something that had been looked at before, but the model made that prediction. We were able to go into the data and show that the prediction was supported. Hmm. Uh, so, and we're in the process of, of further developing this, this idea, but this is sort of just, this, you know, sort of jumps the gun a little bit, but it's a way of illustrating how even sort of abstract models that don't capture all the aspects of an idea can capture the essential elements of the, of the theory and therefore test it. I'll tell you real quick, that model in particular, which um, was published uh, in 2019, along with some collaborators, Mike Gervin, Aaron Lukashevsky, and Chris Van Ruden. Van Ruden um, that model started out very complicated because we started having lots of conversations about all the things that were involved in how people's personalities were represented, the kinds of decision-making that went on to leave social and economic niches and join them, the fact that individuals could belong to multiple niches at the same time, had multiple drivers uh, of decision-making. Um, and the model got really complicated, it had lots and lots of free parameters. And I remember looking at its design and just being like, I can code this, but I don't know how to analyze it. And uh, what happened was through a long process of development, we figured out the, what the essential features of the theory were, what it, what it was the core idea, and stripped away all the things that weren't part of the core idea. And, and we're left with the essential features of the model. Hmm. And to me, like that's one of the great things about modeling is we could capture... This is the essence of the idea. And here's where we can show how it works and what the natural consequences of that idea are. And if you think that our assumptions are wrong, well, great. At least we've got, we've made it extremely clear what we're assuming and what we're not assuming. So if you think we should make different assumptions, I've uploaded my code. Go mess around with my code, make new assumptions <laughs> yeah. and see yeah. what happens. So we're... All of that's very helpful. Uh, you, you obviously explain it very well, which is which is great. How how or where's the the seat of um, theory in modeling? So you've been talking about models, but we haven't yeah. talked about theory. And I guess you can throw in their hypotheses as well. And what probably comes after the theory, of course, or should come after it. But how do how how do we make those distinctions of how we're loading, if, if you will, or uh, housing kind of a model in a, you know, is, does it have to come from a theory or, you know, can we just have hypotheses or how do you think about the, the value or role that theory plays with modeling? I love this question. I think about theory all the time. And I think that one of the primary differences between different sort of scientific or academic disciplines has a lot to do with how they engage with what they call theory and what they mean by theory. Um, there's a great quote by Albert Einstein who said, it's the theory that decides what we can observe. And I, and I think that's right because a theory is, it, I have a, a more formal definition of theory, but before I get to that, I mean, the theory is basically just how we decompose the world hmm. and what we think the essential parts are and what the properties of those parts are and how they're all related to each other. Hmm. And Based on how we break up and parse the world, it lends that framework lends itself to asking different questions. Mm. And I remember, like most people, if they're familiar at all with philosophy of science, will be familiar with Thomas Kuhn and this his idea of normal science versus um, 
revolutionary science and and paradigm shifts. And he's, it's a little vague about exactly what this is. He talks about like, you know, people, there's normal science, people using the sort of methods and theoretical frameworks that are common. And then somebody is a radical and introduces some new ideas. And sometimes they fizzle out and don't go anywhere. And sometimes they take hold and change the shape of how we do science and how we parse the world. And that's a scientific revolution, he calls this, and sometimes calls it a paradigm shift. I think to the extent that this is a useful construct, part of what's going on there is new ways of parsing the world and dividing Mm -hmm. the world into sets of parts and relationships comes up that allows us to meaningfully ask new kinds of questions Mm -hmm. or to get better answers. So when we went from a Ptolemaic view of the universe, the solar system, right, where the, the earth was the center versus, you know, a Copernican view where the sun is the center. You know, both, these, both of these views allow us to predict the motion of the planets from the Earth as we see them in the sky very well. Yeah. You can make extremely accurate predictions about where the planets are in the sky from the Earth without knowing that the Earth isn't the center of the solar system. Mm-hmm. And the Ptolemaics did a really good job at this. But what you can't do is get a rocket to the moon. <laughs> you need to know have a hard sun, time doing that <laughs> right <laughs> um, so by knowing that the sun is at the center new kinds of and you can't do things like predict the existence of new planets accurately mm. which you can do if you know Newtonian mechanics and you know that the center is the center the sun is the center of the universe right a number mm. of the planets were predicted before they were observed based on the movement of other planets and other bodies, mm. because we understood that the planets orbit the sun and they exert gravitational forces on one another. And so if they're moving different from what the theory predicts, well, there you go. This, the assumptions made by the theory are wrong. And one of those assumptions might be, oh, there's only five planets. Turns out there's a sixth and a seventh and an eighth. <laughs> um, so I, I think about the relationship between hypotheses and theories and theoretical frameworks in, in a lot of ways. First of all, and this actually gets back to that, that Stuart Kaufman paper I, hmm. I referenced um, before. Um, so the way science is, is taught and thought about all the time is very much in terms of hypothesis testing. The way we're, we're, people talk about science is the scientist comes up with a hypothesis and then test the hypothesis. A lot of focus is on all the ways we test hypotheses. How do you test it? How do you know that the hypothesis is a good one? Well, how do you know that the hypothesis is supported or not supported? We spend a lot of time training our scientists on things like statistical methods and experimental design to make sure that um, They do a good test of the hypothesis so they can be relatively certain about whether a hypothesis is supported or not. Uh, And that's important. It's good. But relatively little time and often very little time is spent on talking about where the hypotheses come from. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is a catastrophe. I I would agree. I would totally agree. (laughs) Uh, it, it leads some fields to, to basically, and, and I can pick on psychology just because I, I spent a lot of time in psychology departments, so I know about how please, they work. Please do. Them. Please pick on psychology. Uh, but <laughs> I don't think it's only psychology. I think biomedical science is a lot like this. I think a lot of the other sciences are like this. Um, economics, I think, has some of this. Too. Can, yes, parts of economics are absolutely like this. And even yeah. though economics does a little bit better on what I, I sometimes call micro theories, it, Mm-hmm. And I'll, I get to that. It, it doesn't do that well in terms of larger theoretical frameworks. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's very often that someone will come in as a, let's say, a first year graduate student in a psychology department. And the assumption will be you should be coming up with hypotheses or you should already have a hypothesis for testing. And we're going to spend your very first year running experiments to test your hypothesis and try to publish papers about your hypothesis. And the assumption is that someone who's just come into a field should be able to construct meaningful hypotheses that are important (laughs) to test and important to devote resources toward testing. And I think that 
in 99% of the cases, and there are exceptions, but in 99% of the cases, that is crazy. I think but that's that, why you're that's why you're in somebody's lab and you just take all of their their ideas and you just run right. it. <laughs> well, and honestly, that's not that bad an idea. If if you've been working in a field for a decade or two decades, right? You probably have lots of well well you should, right? You should. <laughs> really have lots of well formulated hypotheses that are are well justified. Sure. And so part of, you know, spending time in someone's lab is learning the process of going about, you know, testing these kinds of hypotheses. And that, that to me, that makes sense as, as an essential part of training. Um, but where the hypotheses come from is a whole other thing and understanding what the, the relationships are that, that are implied by the hypothesis. So I, I like to put it this way. And in the book, I, I, I break this down very explicitly. I delineate meanings of hypothesis, theory, and theoretical framework. So I, I say a hypothesis is a prediction that if a particular set of assumptions are met, then a particular set of consequences will follow. Mm -hmm. That's a hypothesis. So in practice, this is either one of two things. It's either one, that the parts of a system are organized in a particular way. So we Mm want to like hypothesize that something is going to be organized in some way. In other words, that a particular decomposition carries some explanatory power for some mm-hmm. phenomenon. Or two, beca- that because the parts of a system are organized in some way, then a, a certain phenomenon will occur and others will not. So mm-hmm. that's a good hypothesis also allow us to exclude and distinguish between competing theories. So what's a mm-hmm. theory? The theory is a set of assumptions upon which hypotheses derived from that theory must depend. Hmm. So this is why the theory, like Darwinian evolution is a theory. Well, actually, let me, let me pause on Darwinian evolution because I think it's sort of more than a theory. But yeah. let's say general relativity is a theory. General mm-hmm. relativity makes certain assumptions. And so we can actually derive many hypotheses about the way certain kinds of systems will work. Or let's take Newtonian mechanics as, a, as something even, you know, more so for that more people will be familiar with. Like Newtonian mechanics assumes that forces and masses and velocities and accelerations are all related in certain ways. And so if we have a system that is a mechanical system for which things like mechanical forces and gravity are the primary forces at play, we can make all kinds of hypotheses Mm -hmm. based on those assumptions. So the theory of Newtonian mechanics allows us to make many, many different hypotheses. So I I would say a strong theory, a theory that's good, is going to allow us to generate not one, but many clear and falsifiable hypotheses. Mm. Okay. So I I, I then kind of, this is a little bit of a softer differentiation because I think the Definition of hypothesis is pretty clear, and the relationship between hypothesis and theory is pretty clear. I also, this is is a little fuzzier, but I I thought it was important to also distinguish between a theory and a theoretical framework. Yeah. What's that distinction? This is a framework is a broad collection of many related theories that all share a common set of core assumptions. Hmm. So, uh, you know, my favorite example would be Darwinian evolution by natural selection, because within Darwinian evolution, evolutionary theory, there are actually many subordinate theories. You can have theories of multi-level selection. You can have theories of neutral selection. You can have theories of sexual selection. And within each of those theories, you can then draw many different hypotheses based on the consequences. And you can do work in multi-level selection theory without thinking at all about sexual selection, and vice versa. But they all, both of them, stem very naturally from the set of core assumptions that are embedded in Darwinian evolution. Hmm. So when we come to hypotheses, you're saying that, well, I'll ask this. When people have come up with hypotheses when they're trying to do a study or they're trying to do science, kind of like that first year graduate student you're talking about. 
we don't spend enough time on a philosophy of science or types of a worldview, but hypotheses do come from somewhere. Whether you know it or not, whether you've identified it or thought about it or constructed a theory about it, it is somewhere there within the person, right? We have, we'll get to this later maybe, but we might have various priors about why we would ask a question this way or why we would want to make a discrimination or a distinction between this versus that. So in the absence of a, a stated theory, um, what are some of, I guess you could say, the negative uh, blind spots there? Like the, the, the fact that this is a blind spot, what are the negative kind of uh, pieces to that that say, look, you know, yes, you can do a hypothesis and then you have methods and you run it and whatever and you have a good, a good study, but lack of a, a way of, of a kind of expository uh, un- understanding or explanation of, of a theory you're coming from is what is the essential element of, I guess, uh, of that for doing science? Yeah, I think it's hugely important. Um, so here's, I'll give you two examples. Of, yeah. I'll give you an example of, of something that came from good theory and one from bad theory. Okay. So um, Charles Darwin, let's stick with Darwin, right? Mm-hmm. In 1862, so it's three years after the publication of Origin of Species, mm-hmm. Darwin is sitting around in England and he has a colleague that shows him a, a, a flower specimen, an orchid, it's, uh, something called a star of Bethel, Bethlehem orchid that has been collected from Madagascar. And Darwin's never been to Madagascar, but he looks at this flower. It's this crazy flower and it's got, a, it's, it's more than a foot long. It's got a foot long nectar spur. So the nectar is at the very bottom. Darwin immediately is like, how would a plant like this reproduce? Because he understands the processes of natural selection, he says, there must be a pollinator that can get down in there. Hmm. And so I predict, and Darwin wrote this down, he said, I predict there must be some kind of insect, like a moth or a butterfly, that has a proboscis that is over a foot long that can get down in there. Never seen one, didn't know it existed, but it was like, there must be one because I understand how natural selection works and how species are interplayed. So I know that if this flower exists and has been selected for by evolution, there must be something that has co-evolved with it that can pollinate it. And lo and behold, 20 years later, Europeans discovered the existence of what's now called Darwin's hawk moth, which is this big moth that has a proboscis that's more than a foot long that pollinates this flower. And because Darwin had strong theory, he was able to make a very precise prediction, which bore out. Now, let's contrast this with one of my favorite examples, which is Daryl Bem and the search Mm -hmm. for extrasensory perception. So Mm -hmm. Daryl Bem is a professor of psychology at Cornell University. And in 2011, he publishes a paper claiming existence, uh, evidence for precognition, the ability to psychically predict the future, uh, in which he basically, it just is p-hacked to hell. It's just an existence of the the worst possible science you could do. Uh, Basically had a bunch of undergraduates look at a computer screen with curtains on it and try to predict which fake curtain would have an image behind it. And it turned out like, okay, you know, if you divide it like, well, if I separate it by gender and we separate it by, you know, pornographic images versus non-pornographic images, and maybe in some cases there's this crazy post hoc justification for why pornographic images like natural selection would have selected for the psychic ability to know when somebody was naked behind a curtain. And uh, this was a big watershed moment in what's now called the replication crisis in psychology. It pointed out that Look, this, this finding is obviously wrong. It's obviously wrong. It doesn't make any sense. And therefore, uh, the reason it was published in a mainstream top journal in the field uh, in social psychology was because it met all the standards for evidence that that field had. And so people were like, well, if this thing that's obviously wrong met our standards for evidence, 
I wonder how many other things that are less obviously wrong, but are actually wrong, got published using these same standards. And it turns out a ton of stuff. And that's been this whole sort of, uh, you know, kind of come to Jesus moment that uh, social psychology and uh, related fields have been going through for the last decade, decade and a half. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that the focus that that study had in psychology was on the methods was like, okay, this was done using poor statistical methods. It was done using poor experimental design and data analysis techniques, but way less attention was focused on the fact that it's completely inconsistent with like everything we know about physics and causality. Mm. And that in itself should make it require much, much higher standards of evidence. Um, one of the things, right. If you, <laughs> if you publish, if you're trying to publish in physics and you have a finding that doesn't make any sense, right? It's not just doesn't make intuitive sense. What that means is that we have empirically backed mathematical formal theory, often going back decades, that can show you why this prediction is impossible. Or if it's not impossible, if what you actually found is correct, then it will overturn decades of work in this field because it means that so many things that we've been assuming are correct have been wrong now that can happen every so often but the standard of evidence for that should be extreme mm -hmm. and the theory driven uh reasoning alone should have absolutely you know disqualified bem from ever publishing his findings without a lot more evidence i wonder here I wonder what this, I keep thinking about this, which is one of these things where, you know, we know certain things at a certain time. And then, you know, when, when we have new data or we have new theories, we hold on tightly to what we want, what we have initially, and then we don't want to let it go. And this is a problem in much of the social sciences is for whatever reason, sometimes there are certain incentive structures that are there, you know, monetary or whatever, or, you know, status, et cetera, et cetera. But I wonder if there's this a, also a kind of um, a thorn in the side of why things can't 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 kind of uh, evolve or grow within within the field, but then also why we get you know um, more in the public is kind of very watered down and, and people don't take the scientists seriously because it is a lot of this kind of nonsense or whatever. So this is slightly tangential, but I, I guess what do you think about I guess. The question here is the impact that, you know, doing not having good theory or, or, or not stating it or knowing that it's corrected or it could change, but not doing, you know, making a correction there, the impact that it could have on, on, on how people receive it later. Yeah. I, I, I think about this a lot and I, you know, I, I love science, right? I love science. Science is the best. And I get so excited and passionate about science. And when I hear people feel skeptical or express, express skepticism about science, my, my reaction is that in some fields, the scientific community has not lived up to the promise of science, has not given the public a science that it should be confident in. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a tragedy. And I, I mean, part of this is part of why I wrote the book, because I wanted to, you know, say, look, this is how we can do things better. And if you're interested in learning a, a, an approach that is really important, here is a set of first steps that you can take to understand how to build coherent theories in the social sciences. And I use social sciences very broadly in the book. It's sort of everything yep. from psychology to economics to behavioral biology, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the chapter eight in the book is called the scientific process and yeah. mm -hmm. build explicit, you know, uh, formal models about sort of scientific investigation we you know the book the chapter talks about different ways we can conceptualize scientific investigation mm -hmm. and then embed that process into a population structure where you can actually have agents 
doing science, investigating things, trying to publish their findings, and being rewarded or not rewarded based on certain incentive structures. And so we can actually use this kind of modeling technique to try to figure out better ways, potentially, to organize the scientific enterprise. Yeah, I mean, I found that book helpful. And it's, it's interesting that it's chapter eight, because it's like you've talked, you've talked about a lot of things before that. And then you, you kind of mention it there sort of towards the back, I guess, third of the book or whatever. So maybe let's use an example here. Uh, this will be fun. Um, let, let's talk about uh, the pandemic and COVID-19 and, and, and all of that. So maybe you can give your best example of building a model uh, based on how contagion spread and why that's important. And I think the reason I'm using this example is because, you know, obviously it's <laughs> a lot of fun because of how people have, you know, kind of you know, <laughs> gone and, and uh, split into sides on this very frustratingly so. But I think that in the absence of a model, you get a lot of bullshit. You get a lot of, a lot of bullshit. And that has real consequences if you're dealing with something like a global pandemic that's happening in the moment. So you, you talk about it in the book, so maybe you can kind of give us the, the kind of long version or whatever of how a model uh, can be helpful in trying to understand how contagion spreads. So you, you can talk about it, transmissibility, uh, equilibrium, the r not herd immunity. You, you mentioned all this, so you can, you can go uh, as, as deep as you want on it. Sure, yeah. I mean, so I, w I was a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine from 2011 to 2014. And that, that's where I first started learning about epidemiology and, and that, those kinds of modeling uh, frameworks. And I, and I thought it was an interesting and important thing to know. And I, I kind of got into it, you know, on and off over the years. And when I started writing this book, I started kind of writing it in earnest, uh, in earnest around 2018. Mm. And at the time I thought, well, I better include a chapter on contagion models because this is just all around an important topic for anyone who wants to model social behavior to know. I just think it is generically an important topic to know. And then two years later. So prescient. <laughs> You're very prescient when you were thinking about this. <laughs> two years later, it turned out everyone absolutely needed to know uh, about epidemiology. Um, <laughs> I'll be yeah. I'll, I'll just, just, just for listeners, Hopkins has a fantastic uh, master's of public health program. And before I'm not I'm mistaken, one of their tracks is on epidemiology where they look at a lot of this stuff. So they're, you know, you, you are, you are at a great place. I mean, I'm sure there's other wonderful uh, MPH programs as well, but I know that one in particular, I've known folks that have gone there. Uh, it's a great program, especially the epidemiology track. It's very nice. Yeah. I mean, that, that Hopkins school of medicine is consistently rated in the, you know, ranked in the top three. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, one, an incredible place to be. And, um, you know, I, <laughs> I find that, th well, models of epidemics are, are really one of the oldest, uh, modeling frameworks in, if, if you consider it a part of the social sciences, uh, which I think increasingly it, it needs to be, yeah. um, the it's one of the oldest modeling frameworks uh, that have been formalized. So um, Kermick and McKendrick, um, who were working in India, uh, studying, I think, um, malaria, um, I might be wrong on that, uh, published their first mathematical models of disease dynamics in the 1920s. Um, so almost, almost 100 years ago. Uh, and people, you know, their sort of core framework for modeling epidemics is kind of what we still use now, although it's been, you know, a lot of the details have been filled in, which is also sort of indicating that if you have a good, good modeling framework, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be replaced uh, when there are problems with it. It can be extended and expanded and adapted. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the basic model is something like we assume a population of individuals that can take on minimally one of three states. Uh, they're susceptible, well, really minimally one of two states. They're either susceptible, meaning they haven't caught a disease or they're infected, meaning they have, and they're contagious and other people can catch it from them. Hmm. You can have other States like recovered or hmm. removed, which is that they've, they've gotten better and maybe they're, uh, maybe they're now immune 
or maybe they're not, or maybe they have unfortunately passed away for the, from the disease. Uh, more complicated models sometimes also have an exposed phase where you have caught the disease, but you're not yet contagious. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you can have all kinds of population structures. You can assume agents are, are interacting at random. You can assume that agents are connected uh, via a network. You can assume that agents are embodied in space and are moving around. And actually, epidemiology is, is one of the main you know, areas where, I mean, it, models have been used a ton for, for a long time. And, and at, at Hopkins, I was exposed to a, a lot of really detailed agent-based modeling. Um, so an, an agent-based model is sort of distinct from an equation-based model. I realize I haven't made this distinction. Um, you know, classically, uh, you know, a mathematical model written out with equations is you're, you're specifying terms in, a, in a, an equation or a series of equations that represent, let's say, you know, in the proportion of individuals in your population that have some status or have some trait or some behavior, and you can re- relate them to each other and, and track their rise and falls. Um, or you can build an agent-based model, which is a, a computer simulation where the agents, which are usually individuals, although they could be larger or smaller scale, like individual cells or firms or nations, um, but let's say they're, they're people, um, they're represented explicitly, almost like a little video game where each of them have properties. And so you can, while it's sort of not as mathematically elegant and you have to run all the simulations to see what's going to happen, you can also include a lot more heterogeneity. So you can have differences in network position, spatial structure, age, disease status, personality, behavioral traits, whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the book, I start out developing, we start out with very, very simple um, models of disease dynamics, starting out with just imagine there's susceptibility and then there's infection and then that's it. And so then we can look at factors that increase or decrease the speed at which the disease goes through the population. Hmm. Then we can do things like put recovery in. So when you recovered, you just go back to being susceptible again. And this kind of thing is often used for models of like product adoption, right? You adopt some product and then you don't, and then you can can again later. Um, But some diseases are like this, like maybe you can can probably model the common cold a little bit like this because you can always get another cold. Um, Whereas other things um, are maybe more closer to an SIR model, susceptible, infected, and covered, where once you've caught it, you're less likely to catch it again, either because you've become immune or because you've passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can build these things into the models and look at things like, let's say, the difference between transmissibility and effective transmissibility. So the transmissibility of a disease is, is how contagious it is. If you are exposed to someone with the disease, how likely are you to catch the disease? Mm-hmm. But at the population level, if we want to look at how quickly the disease is spreading throughout the whole population, it's not enough to just look at how contagious it is when an interaction occurs. We also have to look at the rate at which an interaction occurs. Hmm. Um, So if we have fewer interactions with new people, that's going to slow down the effective transmissibility of the disease. Mm -hmm. And so we can build models that will slow down the spread of a disease. And now we have not one, but two points of attack. We have, we we can have interventions that decrease the actual transmissibility of the disease at the moment of contact. So things like face masks are are pretty good at this. Um, So if you're talking to somebody who's sick and and you're both wearing a mask, you are less likely to catch the disease from them if it's an airborne uh, disease like COVID. On the other hand, let's say you do nothing to, to change that. You can still decrease the absolute transmissibility of the disease. Uh, sorry, the effective transmissibility of the disease, if you just decrease the number of new social interactions you have. So this was what we call social distancing or physical distancing was an intervention that did this. Um, Vaccines, uh, you know, ideally make people totally immune, but in reality, they are more likely to just sort of decrease the transmissibility of the disease. And 
so that is also at that level. And we can build models that incorporate each of these interventions separately and look at how, each, how well each one works independently as well as how well they work together. Mm. And we can also do things like, well, not everyone is going to comply. So what happens if X percent of the population is social distancing or X percent of the population is wearing a mask? And these kinds of factors lend themselves very well to building agent-based models where each of them can be free parameters that can be modeled separately or together. Mm. You can do this in any number of ways. I have a question about the mask thing, just, just because it, there's mixed information on it. So the first thing is, is that we were told to wear a mask during the pandemic and then comes out later that maybe it wasn't as effective and, you know, but not, not in terms of protecting you against getting necessarily the virus, but slowing the spread of transmissibility, things like that. And is it interesting that now we don't really, it doesn't seem like it's as effective because people have had it multiple times. They've been vaccinated for it. It's still, so there's a lot of confusion on there. We don't have to get too much in the weeds on it, but how do we factor in, I guess, the effectiveness of something if it's a novel kind of uh, yeah. virus? So I'm not a virologist mm-hmm. and I, you're, um, you're not because Twitter user so and so apparently is a virologist, and then the next week he's a foreign affairs expert, and then the next week he's, you know. So <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I mean, I did my best to uh, to to do my my actual research, by, you know, uh, my actual research by reading academic papers, searching on Google. Papers. Is that what it was? Your actual uh, research, right? <laughs> yeah, I talked to it. Uh, I. Uh, my neighbor, who I ran into at the drugstore, said, uh, um, but, you know, and, and I, have, I have friends and colleagues that, that are more, you know, actual epidemiologists than I am. Um, so I, I tried to get, you know, as, as up to date information as possible. So, like I said, I mean, the extent to which you buy the con- the conclusions that a model makes is is driven uh, to a large extent by the extent to which you buy the assumptions that are baked into it. Mm. What's nice about a modeling framework like this is we can make how effective an intervention is a free parameter in the model. Mm. And therefore we could say, well, let's say we don't know yet how effective it is. Mm -hmm. We can say, well, if it's this effective, then we need this much compliance to have an effect. If Mm. it's that effective, then we need this percent compliance to have an effect. If it's Mm. this other level of effectiveness, then nothing we do is going to have an effect. And so we can sort of punt on how, on the exact nature of an intervention because we could use a model to simulate all the possibilities or at least many of the possibilities here. And it does seem that uh, masks were always better at preventing me giving you, if I wear a mask, it's more like it prevents me from transmitting the disease. If I'm sick, then it will help you if you aren't sick from getting it just based on the nature of how breath works effectively. You're just just collecting particles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, And that's certainly something that can be modeled. I mean, there's a whole other thing, which is like, is the the sort of uh, public responsibility, social responsibility angle is like always a hard sell with Americans. Yes, it is. (laughs) um, (laughs) You know, um, I, one of my favorite modeling studies, which I only talk about briefly in the book, although I do talk about it, it was, was done um, on vaccine compliance published way back in 20, 2008. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, this is by uh, uh, Sebastian Bonhoeffer and Marcel Salate. And what they did was look at sort of standard computations of herd immunity in a, in a network. So herd immunity is this idea that like, imagine a vaccine is so and so effective. Let's for simplicity, let's imagine it's a perfectly effective vaccine. Um, not everyone can get vaccinated for various reasons. So, so like an example of this would be like uh, polio, I guess, or polio is a great example. The chicken pox, um, I guess, maybe, or yeah, measles is a Meas- classic. Measles, example. right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so measles is very contagious, and there are some people who can't get vaccinated, and so occasionally measles outbreaks happen. Somebody gets measles, 
And if nobody was vaccinated, then the measles would, is likely to spread from person to person to person and basically become an epidemic. If everyone is vaccinated except for the person who gets it, no problem. But if, if most people are vaccinated, then it's likely that the person, even if everyone isn't, it's likely that most of the people who the person with measles gets into contact with will be vaccinated. Or at least most, let's say one is not, most people that that person interacts with is not, are going to be vaccinated. And so as, as long as enough people are vaccinated, mm -hmm. the, the outbreak will fizzle out and it won't turn into an epidemic. With, with measles, it's, I guess the uh, r naught is, uh, is it 1 to 16 or whatever it was? It's high, right? It's very high? It's pretty high, yeah. So the r naught is, is effectively the, the expected number of new infections that an initially infected individual will infect before they recover at the beginning of an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if r naught is less than 1, then the disease is going to fizzle out because... Even on average, more people are people are getting better faster than they're getting than new people are getting sick. Mm. But if R naught is above one, then more people are getting sick. Uh, people are getting new people are getting sick at a faster rate than the people who are already sick are recovering. So it, it increases. And so with, with COVID, what was it? What was the R naught? I guess. So I guess well, with the, or does it depend the on the variant? <laughs> that you know, R naught is not a property only of the disease. It's a property of the disease and the social environment and the behavior mm. of the individual. Mm. So mm. it's something that is dynamic based on not just how contagious the disease itself is, but how connected people are, how much they're taking interventions, et cetera. Mm. But mm. It, it sort of varied. It's sort of a round two, mm -hmm. give or take. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> give or take. I mean, as low as one and a half, as high as three or four sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, also, depending on the strain. Yeah. And, you know, the models can account for all these kinds of things and look for, you know, ways basically both in terms of things like vaccination, as well as things like social distancing or changing the population structure to, to move or not. Mm. So um, there's a whole field of epidemiology called network epidemiology, which is the spread of diseases on social networks. And just accounting for network structure. And so this, this model modeled as a disease and epidemic on a network. And they did, they started out with the thing that most of these models of herd immunity do, which is to say, let's imagine X percentage of the population are vaccinated. How many vaccines, how, what percentage do we need to vaccinate to have a high likelihood that an outbreak will not lead to an epidemic? But the assumption behind most of those models, classically, pre-2008, was that vaccines were randomly distributed. That you have some percentage of the population that needs to be vaccinated, but the models are, are agnostic as to who exactly is vaccinated. Hmm. So um, this, be, this became more of an issue when you have a, 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 um, essentially a live virus or an ever-changing virus where vaccination was the fastest way to try and get people more immune. But I was told that if I take ivermectin, then I don't need to take a vaccine. That's what I was told. I heard that on another right. podcast. So you're, you're getting to the point exactly, right? <laughs> so what, 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 what these authors did was to say, hey, you know, vaccines aren't randomly distributed in the network. <laughs> people who are vaccinated tend to be friends with other people who are vaccinated. And people who don't, who refuse the vaccine tend to be friends with other people who refuse the vaccine. <laughs> so there are clusters of people mm. that are all vaccinated together. And there are clusters of people who are all unvaccinated. And it turns out when you have big clusters of the population that are all unvaccinated, and this is under the assumption that we have an effective vaccine, yeah. then you need a lot more vaccination to get the same level of herd immunity, if you have assortment, if you have these clusters, then if you would, if you then you would need if you had random uh, distribution of vaccines. So a lot of those models previously had been underestimating how mm. many, mm. Uh, how much vaccination we needed to maintain herd immunity. Well, I had the effective uh, vaccine. You know, I got the Moderna, so you know, I didn't get the J and J, and I, I I boosted it a little bit with a little bit of uh, hydrochloroquine and all that. So I'm I, I should be good. So I mean, you're joking, and I and I and I 
I think it is important to be able to joke about this stuff, but I do. And something I say in the book is like, there's a reason that vaccination cannot be a matter of individual choice. It can't be purely a matter of individual choice because we don't live on mm-hmm. islands. We live yeah. in social networks. We live with yeah. other people. And that was yeah. the frustrating thing about it for three fucking years was everybody was wanting this like libertarian, pure, I live on an island. That's my right. You can't tell me what to do. And it's like, that's not how that works. But that's fine. I guess if you want to do that, that's fine. That's totally fine. Never come out of your fucking house. Then do not engage with people socially. Do not send people to school. Do not go any places. If, if that's a way there's a, this wasn't just in the United States or just in, you know, United Kingdom. It's just all over the world. And people are being absolutely careless and reckless. And, and, but it, it wasn't even just that though. It wasn't just that they were listening to information that was at best, at best questionable, at best questionable. It's very generous of you. Yeah. I'm being generous here. I'm being generous. I think there was maybe some questions like, you know, I, I think the ivermectin thing, I'm joking about it, but like, you know, could, could there have been something there? I think some people were concerned about um, some of the heart conditions for males under 30 or whatever it was. I mean, there was some questions I asked, but I mean, again, my whole thing on this was, when the house is on fire, that is not the time to think, you know what? Maybe we should have repainted it. Maybe we should look at that. No, the point is to stop the fire, not asking questions about how you could do all of these things much better or seeking alternatives. Like, and that's what people were doing. They were just asking questions in a time of legitimate crisis. And, you know, again, on and on and on, but, you know, people get super animated about this. But I agree <laughs> because we live in social networks. You cannot, there is some sense of responsibility. This is not the conversation to be had about, you know, libertarian freedom or whatever you want. I mean, that's just not the time to have that conversation. But, you know, again, people, it's my rights and all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a heady issue. I mean, it's one of, again, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because I think that being able to understand these complicated social processes, is important and it's hard and it's really hard to do without models. Um, of course, the, the, there's a, you know, the Nobel prize winning physicist, uh, Murray Gell-Mann, uh, okay. used to say models are, uh, prostheses for the imagination. Oh, that's a nice quote. And I think it's right. Like hmm. if our imaginations were limitless, you know, we could think through the consequences of, of all the assumptions we could make really perfectly. And we can imagine how a complex system will unfold and how one process will lead to another and another and another people, people think they're good at this, but most people are not actually good at this. And <laughs> if you, if you build, uh, if you build something and you lay out your assumptions well, and then you start simulating things and you start, you know, part of the, the, the point of the book is not to say, here is the model for this. Trust it. The point is really to say, here is a way that we can start thinking about how to model it. Let's do it. See what happens. Now let's think about the assumptions we made and see what happens when we make different assumptions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, (laughs) it's fitting that like, you know, the the models in the book that that are just, you know, are, are really, they're different. And I go through many models, but they're all sort of relevant to these kinds of issues because, I mean, after contagion, we talk about opinion dynamics and polarization and talk about maintaining cooperation and reciprocity, we talk mm-hmm. about coordination and norms and inequality, we talk mm-hmm. about, you know, um, how we, <laughs> yeah, well, we should trust science mm-hmm. and, uh, to, and dynamics on networks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think that I really tried to make this as relevant as possible to, the, the questions that we're all facing now. Yeah. 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 I just want to ask one quick question about, you don't mention in the book, I don't think, but is this kind of way in which you're talking about modeling, um, also how people make certain models for politics, right. And how we understand whether it's, uh, polling or focus groups or how we understand certain outcomes or what are the, you know, this gets into probability. Like where does this fit into like kind of the, political science kind of world of things, uh, you know, how, how does that 
I mean, we can just leave it as a footnote, but what, what are your, I guess, thoughts on modeling oh, yeah. being used I, there? I spent, I spent a year as a postdoctoral fellow in a political science department uh, at UC Davis and, and working with political scientists. And I, and I work with political scientists now um, because I, I work with grad students who are interested in things like voting systems and, yeah. uh, yeah. and, in, and related topics. And uh, so in terms of theories related to you know, political issues and political science, absolutely, this is related. Um, there is a difference, right? I mean, when let's say like Nate Silver and 538 make models, they're at some level making a different, this is a different kind of model than what I'm talking about. Most mm-hmm. of what they are doing is a statistical model. Right. And a statistical model is usually a very simple mathematical object, often assuming a linear relationship. Mm-hmm. If A goes up, B goes up. Mm-hmm. A goes up, B goes down. And maybe there are things like called hierarchical linear models where you can have all the parameters in the model are themselves linear models. But it's, it's a pretty atheoretical way to do things. Um, but it's actually extremely powerful uh, to, for making short-term predictions. Mm. Because what you do is you have a bunch of data and you say, here's my data. I'm going to try to fit one of these linear models to it and fit the, the, the parameters of the linear model to see which version of them sort of matches the data as best as possible. The simplest version of this is just like a simple regression line. Uh, but you can, you can get more complicated. Um, and if the future is like the past and the conditions that led to the data being the way they are in your data set persist, then those relationships will hold. And therefore, if the future looks like the past, we can make predictions that are pretty good. It's like as A goes up, B will go up um, out, you know, so in pretty good in the short run. But the past isn't always the best predictor of the future. No. And sometimes things change. And Correct. the conditions that give rise to some phenomenon last year don't hold anymore. Correct. And in that case, those statistical models become basically useless mm-hmm. because there's no theory in them that tells you what to do when the conditions change, especially if you've never seen those conditions before. But if you have a theory mm-hmm. that you can build mechanistic models that can generate the kinds of you know, qualitative predictions under different kinds of assumptions, then that gives you a much sort of a much better informed jumping off point for how to consider some of the problems. Yeah. Nate Silver learned this the hard way in 2016. And the interesting thing about this is <laughs> the <laughs> human, human decisions or lack thereof, human behaviors are not always predictable. And I think the thing about 2016 was that there was a lot of unpredictability at one time, which is almost feels like an anomaly. Um, but you know, maybe that's not true, but, um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very interesting though. I mean, there, I think you would agree that there are always limits to what a model can and can't do depending on whatever the underlying assumptions are. Um, you know, in terms of not necessarily predictions, but you know, what, what are going to be some of these certain outcomes or whatever. That's why I I like the piece that you were talking about with how you de decompose it, right? What you're decomposing, what is, what parts you, well, if you're, if you're focused on certain parts that you see as essential, maybe you think they're essential, but the parts you actually discarded might have been more essential, right? Maybe that happens in this whole way of like, it's, it's always active. It's always alive. There's not just like a static kind of model. Yeah, that's right. And I, there always needs to be models. Models are not separate from data. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. even though the models, that we, especially in the book, I mean, I only talk, there's one chapter where I talk about data and it's toward the end of the book. And it's like, here's, here's how we need to think about the relationship between models and data and fitting models to data, et cetera. But I, I spend most of the book not really thinking about data at all because mm-hmm. I think for, there's, there's a lot you can do without thinking about the data directly mm. because we, 
a lot of it is just learning how to think about the assumptions we're making and to understand the necessary consequences of those assumptions. Mm. And that's a lot of work in itself. Mm. Um, but you're right that there has to be a constant process of feedback where you build a model, the model makes assumptions. Then you look at the data and you say, well, do these assumptions hold Do the do conclusions I make seem to make sense? No. Yes. Maybe there's more data. I need. Mean, there's always more data that I could use to flesh out. There's mm-hmm. always going to be exceptions. There's, there's going to be boundaries. All models have limits, right? Because all models are, are simplifications and there's yeah. going to be, scenarios or conditions for which the model is, is appropriate. Sociologists call this scope, which is, I find, I find a really useful concept. Sort of mm-hmm. The scope of a theory is what are the conditions under which the theory is best use is most useful to make predictions or explanations. And all models have scope and some models have scopes of zero mm-hmm. or they're not useful for anything other than here's a neat thing that's happened. And I find that those kinds of models can still be useful for training your mind to make intuitions about the ways complex systems work. Mm. But other models that are explanatory are explanatory always under some level of narrowness of condition. Mm. Some of them are more broadly applicable than others, but there's always going to be boundary conditions for which past which the model doesn't apply. Mm. And sometimes finding using data to discover what those are are important using data to find exceptions or flaws in the theory. Maybe we didn't think about that is important. Um, Sometimes data will show you that some assumption that you didn't think was important is actually very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, (laughs) there's so many things, like you said, we didn't talk about opinion dynamics. We didn't talk about, I really want to talk about cooperation and, and uh, we didn't talk about the Bayesian brain and things like that. Network theory. So many things I could, I could keep talking to you for hours, but want to respect your time. I guess the, the, the thing here before I let you go is give me the, give me the two minute snapshot of what you're trying to say in the book and, and what you want readers uh, and, and uh, listeners as well to really take away from, from, from what you're trying to say in the book. I'm sort of notoriously bad at these quick <laughs> elevator pitch uh, <laughs> simplifications, but Let me take a step. So I think that the world is just maddeningly complicated and let me, maybe this will help. All right. I got into all of this because when I was in my twenties, I found myself in a lot of conversations uh, with friends and, and people I would meet at parties about complaining about the world basically and saying, You know, it would be better if everyone just did X. A lot of people will be in conversations. It would be better if everyone was like this or or if things were like that. And there are two questions that kept coming to my mind. One is, would it be better? And would it be better for everyone? Maybe some better for some, not so better for others. And also the second question is, let's imagine it would be better. How would we get there from here? We can't just magically snap our fingers and change the world. The world is what it is. And social change happens through a number of processes that we can understand if we work at it. And so I, a big part of my career has been trying to understand the processes through which social change happens or the lack of social change. And it's a massive problem and it's sort of, transdisciplinary. It's beyond any disciplinary boundaries. It's beyond any specific techniques. And I can't do it alone. I can't even do it with me and the handfuls of people who also work on this stuff. We need people to get in earlier. And also it took me till I was like, I'm 43. And I feel like Maybe my late 30s is when I really started to get a grasp of the important problems that needed to get solved and Mm. how I might go about doing that. And that is too late. Mm. Mm. Uh, We need people to start working on these things at a high level 
more of them and earlier. If people could start thinking about these things in a coherent way at 24, Hmm. 22, rather than 38, 35, think of how much more they could do. So I wanted, I want colleagues and collaborators and, and competitors and other people working on this stuff. And I thought to myself, okay, what are some of the important things that I think people working on this stuff should know? And what are some of the core models and modeling techniques and theories and perspectives that you need to get started really taking seriously the question of modeling social phenomena? Hmm. And then I put them in a book and, hmm. uh, you know, I, I couldn't put everything I wanted in the book. Otherwise the book would be a thousand pages long, <laughs> but, uh, I, I tried to, you know, narrow it down to, to what, what was hopefully essential hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, you know, hopefully people look at it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's wonderfully said. The book is called modeling social behavior, mathematical and agent based models of social dynamics and cultural evolution through the wonderful Princeton University Press. Uh, people can go and pick this up. Any place you want to point people to in particular, whether it's uh, some of your research or your work or anything online, anything in particular? Oh, you can find me uh, and all my stuff that I work on at uh, my website, which is just smalldino.com. Mm. And uh, I'm on social media uh, ostensibly, but I, I don't, uh, I'm not as active as I once was. So uh, mm -hmm. feel free to check me out on, yeah. uh, on the web stuff. Yeah. Paul, this was so much fun. I could keep talking to you for, for hours and hours. I, I really get really uh, uh, invigorated with this kind of discussions that, that, we, that we need and all the good work you're doing, other folks like yourself are doing. So big, big, big thanks for, for coming on and, and, and uh, explaining all this. It's, it's very, very important. It was my pleasure. Thanks.